How many of you would agree with my wife that Christmas season is the most wonderful time of the year? Got some hands going up everywhere. In my household, we do not have four seasons. We have two seasons. You have spring, summer, fall, winter. We have two seasons in the Delft household, and it is Christmas season and waiting for Christmas season. Those are the only two things that matter in my household. If you come to my house in April, you will see some kids wearing Christmas jammies because Christmas jammies are their favorite jammies. They got holes in the knees, but our kids are wearing them in March, April. Every Friday, we have movie night in our household. Movie night, and in July, we're watching Christmas Chronicles because my kids love Christmas. I think we have a picture of my family we're going to throw up on the screen. They're really, they're really pretty. I'm the black guy in the back. <laughs> my, my wife supports the one in the corner. Her name is Kelly. She's my boss. Uh, we've got four kids. The, one, the daughter that my wife is holding, that's Lexi. She's seven. She's the boss. Uh, the white kid in the far corner, that's Joel. <laughs> it's okay. Don't, you can laugh. It's safe. <laughs> can we laugh? Am I going to get canceled? 25 seconds in this guy's sermon. Uh, the girl I'm holding, that's Audrey. She's my little clone. And the one I'm holding on to is the troublemaker. That's Joshua. Joshua Daniel Delft. We named him Joshua Daniel because he was born in March of 2020. And Joshua was a leader in the middle of a pandemic of fear. My son was born in a pandemic. And so we decided to name him a name that was full of faith. And I was holding him because he is the number one terror in our house. And so if you would like to adopt Joshua, please text Joshua to 32320. And we will deliver him today. That's my family. I love them. But we love Christmas time. To be honest with you, I hate Christmas. I hate Christmas because I'm a Grinch before we put our Christmas lights up. I'm a Grinch before we put our Christmas lights up because I hate the pressure of buying the perfect gift during Christmas time. Every other time of the year, you buy someone a gift. It's unexpected. They're happy. It's their birthday anniversary. But Christmas time is the season where everyone's going to compare my kid's gift to their kid's gift. So the week after Christmas, my daughter Lexi is going to go into Kids Coast, and she's going to be so excited about her Huffy bike. She's going to be so excited, I got a Huffy bike, until she meets her friends Dory or Ella, and they're going to say, well, my dad bought me a titanium alloy bike that was uh, designed in partnership with a NASA space shuttle, um, and you just pedal it once, and it can go up a hill. So I hate Christmas time because my gifts get compared. But the moment we break out all the ornaments and we put up the Christmas tree and there's something special about my house in the middle of the night, Christmas time. Do you ever feel that way with the Christmas lights and there's a glow in your home? I love that feeling. I love driving around in the Christmas season because it seems like Christmas time is the last holy season we have in our great nation. Everywhere, it seems like people stop in some way, shape, or form to recognize that the Word became flesh to dwell among us. Even if you go to New York, my family lives in New York, you're 2% less likely to get cussed out when you're driving in Christmas time because it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's peaceful even in New York City. They almost may even smile at you when you're walking in Christmas time. It's the most wonderful time of the year. I love this season of Christmas. In my family, my mom loved Christmas time. My parents aren't Americans. They're from a country in South America called Guyana. And my parents loved celebrating Christmas here each and every year. Two missionaries from Indiana in 1952 took a mission trip to Guyana. And they went door to door in my dad's neighborhood, invited people into church, and they knocked on the Delft household. They knocked on the door of the Delft household. My dad was one of 11, and they invited them to church. And that week at that revival meeting, my family met Jesus. My grandfather, who was a police officer, as was his father and his father, amazing guy, but he had a little problem with alcohol. 
He wasn't an angry drunk. He wasn't a mean drunk. He was a generous drunk. And so when he would get paid, he'd go to the bar and spend most of his salary just being generous to all his friends. Problem is, is he had 11 mouths to feed at the home. But the moment he met Jesus, everything changed. The moment he met Jesus, in a moment, alcoholism ended because he was in the presence of God. Amen. And because of that impact, my dad at the age of 14 gave his life to Christ. And when he gave his life to Christ, he continued the same freedom that his father had. And now here I am standing before you, the third generation of sober Delft men, because of the decision that happened in 1952. That's why I celebrate Christmas, because I know that when the word became flesh to dwell among us, it changes everything. And so when my parents became new in the church in Guyana, the church was this melting pot of ethnicities. In Guyana, there's black people, there's Asian people, there's Indian people, and everyone was in church together. It was this amazing thing. My mom got really sick in 1978. She had to move to America. And so when they came to America, they were so excited to join the American church because the American church had shaped their faith. But then they came to America and they noticed that the words of Martin Luther King were real, that Sunday was the most segregated day of the week. And my parents couldn't pick a side because they loved their black brothers and sisters. They loved their white brothers and sisters. So the solution in the Delft household was every single Sunday, we went to two churches. Thank you, America, for not integrating. Thank you. Thank you. For me, every morning I went to two churches, an all-black Baptist church, and so I was swaying with the best of them. And then an all porcelain church that was a little different. Hilton Head Presbyterian. You can go there this Sunday. Just click off online. Just click on what's going on over there. But every Sunday in the Christmas season, at Hilton Head Presbyterian Church, we would celebrate Advent. And if you're new in church, Advent is the season leading up to Christmas. And it's supposed to be a season of celebration and preparation for our king coming to dwell among us. And so Advent season is celebrated with four candles. And so the first candles, typically purple, would celebrate hope. Hope. And this is the hope that hundreds of years before Jesus was born, his birth was foretold by the prophet Isaiah. So leading up to Christmas, we want to celebrate the hope of Christ. Second week, we celebrate faith in the Advent season. Faith that Mary and Joseph had to live out their calling on the journey to Bethlehem. Just so you know, when Mary and Joseph were living out the call of God in their life, they didn't know the end. It was very uncertain for them, so we celebrate their faith. Week three, we celebrate joy. And this is the joy of the shepherds when they finally met their king. And when they met their king, their reasonable act of worship was generosity. So they gave gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. My dad would always say gifts of gold, Frankenstein and myrrh. That was his little Christmas joke. And then on Christmas Day, we celebrate peace. And this is the knowledge that the Prince of Peace came to dwell among us. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. If you don't have your Bibles with you, we'll throw it up on the screen. Or you can download the Bible app for free. It's always a good thing whenever you are in church to be looking at the Scripture for yourself. It's a great thing. Context is everything. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The default of our world is darkness. When you purchase a house, 
when we design this building, you don't have to purchase a darkness package. Why? Because darkness is the default in any room. You purchase a lighting package to light up a house. Darkness is the default of the world we live in. What's the first thing that God created when he created the world? He had to speak light into existence because darkness is the default of our world. Not just physically, but darkness can be the default of our mindset. Darkness can be the default with how we see the world around us, but the hope of Christmas is that light came into the world. When you read throughout the New Testament, you see God's attempts time and time and time again to use ordinary men to shine light, but he had to send his son. And that's what we get to celebrate today. And maybe for you, you need to understand that, man, why is darkness the default of my life? When you think about the last seven days when you woke up, how many days did you wake up excited about the day, ready to go, hopeful that God was going to overcome your problems? Or did you wake up a little sore? Did you wake up a little groggy? Did you wake up a little tired? And you started thinking, oh, man, how are we going to pay these bills? Did you wake up in the morning and say, man, will I ever get over what happened last week? last month, last year. For our time together, I just want to share this one declaration that I believe that God's word and my life seems to be screaming, and this is the title of my sermon today, Shine Light Into Darkness. Shine light into darkness. I want to share with you for a few moments three ways that you can shine light into the darkness that you may see in your life. So first thing I want to talk about today is his light is shining through the pain of your past. If you flip your Bibles over to Matthew chapter one, I want to read to you the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. If I'm honest with you, I wouldn't have written it this way because uh, unlike our culture today, Jesus lived in a cancel culture. Unlike 2021, it's very different now. Jesus lived in a cancel culture where what your family did generations ago could still be a mark against you before you were even born. And so if I was writing Matthew chapter 1, I would have just stopped at verse 1. It says this, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Boom. I would have stopped there, and then I started talking about Mary. That's what I would have written. But then, Scripture Man, smells like real life. And then it goes through his genealogy. Let's read it together. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. That's cool. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Why would you mention Tamar in the genealogy of Jesus? I can't talk about what Tamar went through. Let's just say it this way. Tamar was the victim of family abuse horrible. Why would you mention that? That's painful. Perez is the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Minadab. Minadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. What did Rahab do for work? It is the oldest profession, but that's not what I would put in the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. How did Ruth meet her husband? Ruth went to the wisest woman she knew one day and said, hey, how do I get this dude? I'm feeling him. She said, hey, wait till the party's done. He's really drunk. And then just slide on in. And then magically, Ruth got married. Side note, some of you can't tell your kids how you really met your husband. Well, we met at a social club and... And I was praying, and, and then your dad came here. <laughs> Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. That's what I would have said. I would have just said, hey, his ancestors had King David, because that's exciting. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. We know her name is Bathsheba. They even say it that way. So you knew it was messed up. It says, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Uriah was the top fighter for King David, 
loved him with his whole heart, loved him with his whole heart. And David stole his wife and killed his Jocko Willink. He killed his most faithful Navy SEAL commander because he wanted what he wanted. That's not what I would have put in the genealogy of Jesus. And sometimes in our life, when we look backwards, all we can see are the mile markers of pain. All we can see are the mile markers of failure, of abuse, of all the things that didn't come through. 2016, my dad finally became an American citizen. And I think I got a picture of him becoming an American. So excited, so excited. Um, my dad was more American than most Americans in the room. In the 90s, I remember, like preparing for this, I had to remember, he was, he was picketing for Ross Perot in the 90s in Southern California. That's the most American thing you could ever do. And he wasn't American. So 2016, he finally becomes an American. We go to the service. I don't think it's called a service when you go to a courthouse, but it felt like, it felt like Easter Sunday in a courtroom. 112 different countries represented people from everywhere. It was like a picture of the world. The judge got up. He was hyped. He's like, as an American citizen, you have more rights and privileges than any other citizen of a nation in the history of mankind. He went off, you know, like it was amazing. There's this guy from Eastern Europe who was like three rows in front of me. And he said like the oath of naturalization, like he was like, he had his hands up like this. I was like, hey, player, they ain't going to shoot you if you get it wrong. It's okay. <laughs> uh, it was such an amazing time. And it was a joyous day. My dad doesn't smile like that most of the time. My dad was a police officer for 15 years. His default is, but he was just beaming. We get in the car and we're driving home and I can hear him quietly say, it took me 38 years to get this. And my dad started crying. My dad don't cry. I've seen him cry two times in his life before. But when he started looking backwards, he saw all the missed opportunities because he wasn't a citizen in this country. He started a cleaning company because he went through three years of underemployment and he had to figure out a way to put food on the table. So for his whole life, he owned a cleaning company. And if you met my dad, he was one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. And he, was, he lived a life underneath his, his ability from what he could see. And so when he saw that sheet of paper, even though it signified progress in his life, all he could see was the pain of his past. And maybe when you look back at your life, that's what you see too when you look backwards. Maybe you just see the failure. But the hope of Christmas is that Jesus shines a light through the pain of our past. The reality is this. Your past actually contains his story of faithfulness, goodness, mercy, if you just choose to look for it. And so I read Matthew chapter one wrong. Tamar went through family abuse, but there was a sweet moment of reconciliation. Rahab was a harlot, but she was the only one who could see the spies through the lens of faith and hope and knew that their God was the one she needed to worship. And in doing so, she saved her whole family. Ruth had a sketchy moment when she met her husband, but her husband was honorable, he was pure, he was right, and he protected her even in the middle of a sketchy circumstance. And if God can call David a man after his own heart, then there's hope for me and you as well. God's light is shining through the pain of your past. Second way, God is moving today. His light, is, his light shines through your present circumstances. His light shines through your present circumstances. If you have your Bibles, keep flipping down. Matthew chapter 1, pick it up in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, 
because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The angel came to Joseph privately in a dream. The angel came to Elizabeth privately. The angel came to Mary privately. It wasn't an announcement to the whole town that this is what's happening. God spoke a word to each of them internally, but their external circumstances did not change. Mary knew that the baby inside of her was from God, but no one else did. She may have told them, but they had to believe in faith. They didn't see the angel. So Joseph had to make a decision to believe what God deposited in my heart internally, even though it didn't line up with what people could see outside. How many of you have ever felt that way? How many of you have ever felt that God promised something to you on the inside, but no one else seemed to get that memo? You know you're supposed to be an entrepreneur, but all you have are failed businesses. You know you're supposed to have a child, but all you've had are miscarriages. You know you should be married by now, but you're still single, ready to mingle, but there's no suitable people around you. You don't want to go to that app for that relationship. You know that's a whole other feed that will only be more painful. And what do you do? When your external circumstances don't line up with the promises of God in your heart, you got to do some work. So God moved me from an amazing church that was serving and leading. I was content. I was excited. I was happy. He told me to go to a new season. I went to the new season. I was working in the corporate world, and I loved my job. I was working for an amazing company in Spartanburg, South Carolina. They were doing amazing things. I loved it. But inside... The promises that I knew God placed on my heart wasn't lining up with what I was doing on the outside. And I started to doubt, did God even say that? Because the default of my heart many times is darkness. I see the worst instead of saying, no, nah, man, God really gave me that word. And so I went to a counselor. I started seeking wisdom and I started realizing that I don't believe God's promises in my life. And so I stole my wife's recipe card and I, and I wrote, I wrote a, a recipe for motivation. So I'll give you some of my, some of my, uh, some of my things I've, I've said over myself. I'm directed by his spirit. My family's protected by his covering. I speak life over the hurting. His faithfulness are facts I can stand on. His favor provides me with power. And I started saying that stuff. But motivation without being rooted in the word of God can only go so far. The word tells us do not be... Do not conform no longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you root the promises of God over your life with his word, it actually changes everything. So I had to remind myself what his word says. The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He who refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. And when I started living that out, Things started shifting in my life because I could see his light. Please do not do it. Don't go there. You can go on TikTok right now. And I got all these morning motivational things that I started doing because I realized that like, hey, if I believe that I am designed and built to refresh others, I'm going to start doing it. So I started doing it on TikTok with your 12-year-old. And so just grab your 12-year-old's phone and you can go there and you can laugh at me. I started going on Facebook Live in the middle of the night and just started doing like, impromptu sermons. And I just started saying, you know what? If God has given me these gifts, I got to live it out right now, even if my current circumstances seem to be confusing. Third way his light shines is his light shines through you. So for hundreds of years, Jesus' birth was prophesied over. People knew that this light was coming. I just read John chapter 1 that he is the light of the world. But then when the light got out the manger, started walking around and started talking, this is what he said. You are the light of the world. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus says that you are the light of the world. If you have faith in Christ, you are the light of the world. You are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. But he says, let your light shine. That doesn't mean make your light shine. That means you got to get out the way. You got to get out the way and let it out. How do I let out my light? Well, you got to believe it's in you. Jesus said that we get the gift of the Holy Spirit when he left, a counselor. And the Holy Spirit is in your heart and in your life. And you know what God has done? He's positioned you in your job. He's positioned you in your family. He's positioned you in your community to be the light. If I came to your workplace and started preaching this sermon, people would kick me out. Why? Because I'm not positioned to be in your workplace. You are. Kids Coast is a great assistant to growing your children in the ways of God. But you know what your kids need? You. Your kids need you to, in a broken way, talk about the goodness, grace of God in your life. Your kids need your real testimony, not the highlight reel, because you are the light of the world. So speak words of life into hard places. The Spirit of God can do that. Submit your schedule to acts of service. There's something special that happens when your kids see you in the habit of service. And I'll just go ahead and say, there's no better place to serve consistently than right here Right now at Seacoast, at all our locations, we are in desperate need of men and women who can see themselves as the light, and they serve. There's something amazing that happens when you submit your schedule to just saying, God, will you use me? Maybe you need to invite someone with you to Christmas at Seacoast. Nah, man, I got to clean up my testimony before I invite someone. That's a lie. One of my favorite invites I've ever seen to church was this dude, we'll call him John. Uh, years ago, I led a church that was in the middle of downtown Charlotte, North Carolina. Downtown Charlotte is called Uptown. It's kind of weird, I know. And the campus was right across the street from the bar district. And this dude, John, walks into church, 915, a little bit drunk. I could sm smell the party juice about 10 feet away. And his hair was disheveled, and he's like, hey, man, have you seen, have you seen Elena? I'm like, hey, player, I don't know who she is. He's like, last night at the club over there, she invited me to church. And I was like, no judgment. Um, hey, just go inside, and then we'll try and find her afterwards. You know what happened? He went to church. London was probably singing, and then he gave his life to Jesus Christ that day. Because God used a broken vessel to bring someone to him. Look at the evangelists in the New Testament. They were broken, messed up people who had been healed by Jesus. And then all of a sudden, they had a word to give to the lost and dying world. Why? Because when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ, he makes all things new. We don't heal people by the perfection of our testimony. He heals people through our broken flaws. And so, the hope is that even though your past is painful, there's another narrative. There's another story. There's purpose through that pain. The faith that Mary and Joseph took to walk in that pathway of Bethlehem, knowing that their future wasn't certain, is the same faith we need to walk it out today. Scripture says his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Walk it out. Joy. Joy. Do you fill your heart with the joy that Christ is with you? You do that by speaking of his goodness. You do that by performing acts of service. You do that through generosity. And do you know that the Prince of Peace is with you? His peace is here. 
And so as we begin to go into response time, I love to pray for you that you would receive the peace of our Heavenly Father. Jesus, we thank you that you give us peace. We thank you, Lord God, for the faith that is locked up in our history. We thank you, Lord God, that you have a better word over our life. And we thank you, Lord God, that the cross really does heal us. We pray, Lord God, that in this Christmas season, we will remind our hearts that we are the light of the world. We pray these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen.